Well, in the last session, we began to explore Edward's kind of preliminary answer to this question. We looked at uh, four assumptions he made about uh, uh, that we must bring to the table as we talk about the end for which God created the world. Uh, then we looked at four uh, qualifications that he offered for um, these are the criteria that any candidate must meet if it's going to be considered for the end for which God created the world. And then we began to look at four candidates. And the four candidates that he, he mentions are the demonstration of God's attributes, so God displaying all of his perfections, then the knowledge of those perfections as a result of that display. So uh, somebody has to see it, and that's a mental thing mainly in, in the understanding. And then not just a knowledge, but a love. So loving what we've seen of the display. And then the final one being an overflow of God's fullness. Okay, an overflow of God's fullness. And that those four things seem to meet at least two of the criteria. And right now we're in the middle of exploring whether those criteria meet the, uh, the third, sorry, those, those candidates meet the third criteria. And the third criteria, you'll remember, is any answer we give must display God's supreme regard for himself. It must show that God loves himself, that he's holy, that he values himself infinitely because he is infinitely valuable. And so then the question we'd have to ask is, let's take these four and let's begin to ask the question, does a display of God's attributes uh, manifest God's supreme regard for himself? And the answer Edwards gives is yes. If God loves himself, he'll naturally love to display his perfections. Does the knowledge of God's attributes display God's love for himself? Well, yes, because if God, if God loves himself, he's going to love the knowledge of himself existing in other beings. And does God love love for his attributes? Well, sure, because if God loves his own attributes, he's going to love when other people love them. And does God love the emanation, the communication of his fullness? Does that show a supreme regard for himself? Yes, because if he loves what's in here, then certainly he's going to love it if it's out there, and if it's out there and he sees it, it's showing he loves what's in here infinitely. And so Edwards walks through each of those four candidates and says, yes, they meet this third criteria. So now not only do these candidates meet, is it originally most valuable? That is, did it exist before creation and did God value it? He says, yes, it did. Uh, is it attainable? Is it a consequence of creation? Is it something that God can actually do through creating? And he says, yes, in the, in the case of those four, each of them is uh, attainable and a consequence of creation. And now we've said it also meets the third criteria. It manifests God's supreme regard for himself. So three down, only one to go. But at this point, before he uh, addresses that fourth, that it's actually the first qualification, he's gonna give his, what, he, what would be his preliminary answer we talked a little bit about it, about the fact that uh, as an original property of his nature, uh, God has a disposition to emanate, to overflow, and that's what moved him to create the world, and that the emanation itself was what he aimed at as the last end. We gave an important clarification that in saying God loves the emanation and the overflow, it doesn't mean that he makes creatures his end as though he needed them to overflow, but instead, it's that he loved to overflow. He has a desire to overflow that's original to himself, and he gives creatures existence in order to make it happen. They're derivative of that original desire to overflow. And then we looked at this remarkable statement where Edward says, it's as though God's in an incomplete state without the overflow, without this add extra outside of himself existence and communication of his fullness. It's as though he's incomplete in the same way that Adam was incomplete without Eve. And he draws upon the Bible, he doesn't really mean that it was incomplete, he just means that the Bible talks in remarkable ways, saying that the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is the fullness of Christ. Uh, woman is the glory of man. Israel is the glory of God. So then, we've got these four candidates. How do we narrow them down? Is it just one of them? Shouldn't we have one supreme, ultimate, original, chief end that's at the end-all, be-all of everything? How do these four relate to each other? How does a display of perfections, knowledge of perfections, love of and delight in perfections, and communication of internal fullness relate to each other? Can we narrow them or combine them or something? What, what do we do with four candidates? We need one. What's the single end? Well, to answer that question, we need to take a little interlude. And the interlude is going to talk a little bit about Edward's view of the Trinity. 
And it's something that I've held back because Edwards holds it back in the treatise as a whole, but I think at this point it's appropriate to bring it out into the light. Uh, one Edwards scholar says that his Trinitarianism, his, his doctrine of the Trinity, ran like a subterranean river throughout his career as a pastor and polemicist. And I think it's a really good way to describe it. Oftentimes, what that, what that means is oftentimes Edwards is talking about one thing and underneath flowing like a subterranean river, giving life to whatever he's visibly saying is the doctrine of the Trinity, is his belief in God as Trinity. So what, what did he believe about it? Well, he never published on it directly, at least anything specifically on the Trinity. It showed up, of course, in his sermons and writings. But he had an unpublished essay, kind of his notebook on the Trinity, that he had eventually planned to work into one of these other treatises he never got to. And so we can look at that to at least get kind of a snapshot of the way he thought about the triune God. And what Edward said was this. One way to think about the Trinity is to see God knowing himself or having an idea of himself and that idea being the Son and then God loving himself mutually between the Father and the Son and that being the Holy Spirit. Or again, Edwards thought that the Father was God in his direct existence the Son was God's eternal idea of himself, and the Holy Spirit was God's eternal love for himself. You think that sounds a little bit odd. Where, does that even, is that biblical? Should we talk that way? I mean, he, he at one point in this unpublished essay says, imagine that you could have an idea of everything you did over the last hour, and you could behold everything you did over the last hour with perfect clear clarity. You could just see it, everything you did. If you could do it with perfect clarity, perfect clarity I'm talking, not just kind of memory, but perfect clarity, Edward says you would effectively be two people. There'd be the you that's doing the thinking, and then there's the image that's being thought about. Your idea of yourself would be yourself over again. It's kind of like... Um, Sometimes, I don't know if you were, maybe when you were a kid, you, you saw some of these, I don't know, cartoons or shows uh, where kids would come up to some kind of magic mirror and there'd be the, the mirror image of them and somehow they'd like fall into the mirror world and they'd have to, the rest of the show would be trying to get back out of that mirror world. It's kind of like that. Where does the guy in the mirror go when you walk off stage? When you're, you're, you see yourself and you lift your arm and he lifts his arm. And it's a perfect image. Well, if you can imagine that there's the you on this side of the mirror and then there's the you on that side of the mirror, that's something like what Edwards means when he says that God has a perfectly clear idea of all of his perfections. He views his perfections as in a mirror perfectly and the view he has is so potent, is so real that it's actually himself over again so that there's now two infinite, eternal, unchangeable persons in the one God. And then not only does God see himself in this image, but God delights in what he sees. The Father delights in the, his image in the Son, and the Son delights in the original that is the Father, and that that mutual love is so real and so vivid and so clear and so perfect that it stands forth as the third person, the Holy Spirit. This was Edward's psychological model of the Trinity. And you think, again, is that really biblical? That sounds kind of weird to think about that way, but is there anything in the Bible that would point that way? Edwards thought there was. Here's what he says about the Father. The Father is the deity subsisting in the prime, unoriginated, and most absolute manner, or the deity in his direct existence. Hereby we see how the Father is the fountain of the Godhead. He's the one who does the thinking that produces the Son and the Spirit. And why, when he is spoken of in Scripture, he is so often, without any addition or distinction, called God. You ever notice that? Sometimes it'll be, you talk about God the Father, but sometimes it's just like God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit as though God was the proper name for the Father, or that the Father was especially God, even though we know that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are equal as persons, which has led some to think that he only was truly and properly God. So that's Edward's view of the Father. Now what about the Son? Therefore, as God with perfect clearness, fullness, and strength understands himself and views his own essence, that idea which God hath of himself is absolutely himself. This is what I said a moment ago. This representation of the divine nature and essence is the divine nature and essence again, so that by God's thinking of the deity, he must certainly be generated. That's the word we often translate begotten, only begotten son. 
Hereby there is another person begotten. There is another infinite, eternal, almighty, and most holy in the same God, the very same divine nature. And again, and this person is the second person in the Trinity, the only begotten and dearly beloved Son of God. He is the eternal, necessary, perfect, substantial, personal idea which God hath of himself. And that it so seems to me to be abundantly confirmed by the word of God. The Son is the deity generated by God's understanding or having an idea of himself and subsisting in that idea. Now again, you think that sounds interesting, kind of philosophical to say that the Son is God's idea of himself, his perfect idea, and that that's the second person. That's the one who becomes flesh at Christmas that we celebrate, Jesus Christ. Is it biblical? Well, Edwards thought it was. He says, you know, I think it's confirmed by the word of God. You ever thought about these texts this way? Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, as though God were beholding himself in a mirror, an image. Or 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, same thing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. To, why? To keep them from seeing what? Well, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now, you and I are made in God's image according to his likeness, but the Son is the image, the perfect representation of the deity. In fact, that's what we see in Hebrews 1. He is the radiance, the shining out of the glory of God. Here it is, the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint, the representation, as though God stamped himself on something, and the image was so perfect that the image was another personal being a second person in the Godhead. Or John 1.1. 1, 1. This is the one that I think is Edwards kind of helps us think about it. In the beginning was the Word, or the Logos. The Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And you think, oh, Word. Yeah, what's a Word? Well, a Word is a thought that we express. A thought that we express. So what is the Son? The Son is God's thought expressed, generated, begotten. This is how Edwards is thinking. The Bible kind of confirms this way of thinking about the Trinity. So as God eternally, from all eternity, God has been thinking about himself. He didn't have anything else to think about when it was just him. And so as God thought about himself from eternity, there was eternally begotten an idea, a perfect, clear idea of himself, and that idea was himself over again. That idea was the Son of God. So, See, if you buy that, God has an image. He's always had an image. He's always had a representation. He's always had an other that is a perfect, have you seen me, you've seen the Father kind of image. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, Edward says this, the Godhead being thus begotten uh, by God's loving an idea of himself and showing forth in a distinct subsistence or person in that idea, there proceeds a most pure act and an infinitely holy and sacred energy arises between Father and Son, between God and His idea, in mutually loving and delighting in each other, for their love and joy is mutual. This is the eternal and most perfect and essential act of the divine nature, wherein the God acts to an infinite degree and in the most perfect manner possible. The deity becomes all act. The divine essence flows out and is, as it were, breathed forth in love and joy, so that the Godhead therein stands forth in yet another manner of subsistence, and there proceeds the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the deity in act. The Holy Spirit is God's love and delight. The Holy Spirit is the deity subsisting in act, or the divine essence flowing out and breathed forth in God's infinite love to and delight in himself. So you see the picture, right? Just as God can perfectly visualize himself in the Logos, in the Word, in his Son, so he loves what he sees. And the son loves what he sees. And as they love, it's so real and so full and so boundless and so infinite that love is so intense that it's actually an eternal third person, the Holy Spirit. This is Edward's vision of the Trinity. Is that biblical? Well, there's these interesting phenomena in the Bible, if you pay attention. Edwards did. He was a very, very careful student of the Scriptures. And he says, what about Romans 5? Where in verse 5, Paul says, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts how? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, and he says, isn't it interesting that God's love is poured into us? How? Because the Holy Spirit is given to us. As though the love of God 
and the Spirit of God are identical. Or, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And Edward says, now, are those really two separate things? Should we think of them as their joy was over here and the Holy Spirit was something totally separate over here? Or is it saying something more like, whenever there's joy in God, the Holy Spirit is present. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God's delight in himself in us, coming to exist in us. So joy in the Holy Spirit. So it's amazing, he says, how often you'll go through in the Bible and, you, and you'll find the Spirit, and words that are often clustered around him are love, joy, delight. Or this passage here in 1 John, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. So God is, abides in us. God dwells in us. And by this we know that he abides in us. How? How do we know that? By the Spirit whom he's given us. So God abides in us so the, because the Spirit's in us. That makes sense. The Spirit is God. Well, what's interesting is that a few verses later, John comes back and says, no one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. I've already said that. And now his love is perfected in us. By this, by what? We know that we abide in him and he in us. How do we know that God abides in us? Because he's given us of the Spirit. Oh, still good. Okay. But now we've got this love mentioned. So we've come to know and to believe that the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And you begin to look at that passage, and you begin to think, I think that God abiding in us, and the Spirit abiding in us, and love abiding in us are all three different ways of saying the exact same thing. And of course, God, the text itself says, God is love. And Edwards remarks, there's two things that we're told God is. The word was God, God is love. And he says, why can he say that? Because the word is the second person of the Godhead and love is the third person. Love is the third person. God's mutual love and delight, which then overflows once we exist to us. Or this one. I listed one of my favorites, probably. Edwards noticed this odd thing in Paul's letters. At the beginning of every one of Paul's letters, Paul makes a statement something like this in Ephesians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the immediate thing that you ought to think if you're a Trinitarian Christian is, why did he leave the third one out? It just seems like in all of them, he does this. He doesn't say grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Why does the Spirit kind of always get left out, shunted aside, ignored, swept under the rug? Is, is he really equal? And Edward says, I don't think he's left out. He's just present in a different way. The Holy Spirit is the grace and the peace that come from God and from the Lord Jesus. The, Spirit, the grace is that love and delight between God the Father and God the Son that overflows to undeserving people. And what do we call it when that love overflows to undeserving people? We call it grace. In fact, Edwards has a whole treatise called A Treatise on Grace where he continually draws the connection between grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God as the preeminent, as the, the full perfections. Like if, you, if you're going to take all of the perfections of God and bundle them up you'd, and then give it to us, what would that be? It would be the Holy Spirit. That's the blessing we get by grace. And then Edward says, look, we see this, this come together in a beautiful passage, the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, I mean, this, is, this really does pull it together in a really concrete and, and wonderful way, what Edward sees about the Trinity. You got Jesus there, he's baptized, he went up from the water, and the heavens were op opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. So now, here's the heavens open, down from heaven comes the Spirit like a dove, and it rests on him. Now we've got two persons. We've got Son and we've got love, sorry, we've got the Spirit coming to him, right? Flowing to him, flying to him, being poured out from heaven to him. And then we get words. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. Now who's saying that? Clearly the Father. So the Father speaks, and what does he highlight? That I love my Son with whom I am well pleased, and I delight in him. It's as though God is enacting for us, showing us in a visual picture what's been going on from all eternity, right? Father seeing the Son, seeing the perfect reflection of him in the Son, and saying, I love you. I'm pleased with you. I delight in you. And how do I, how does that, what does that look like? 
What is that? It's the Holy Spirit descending, flowing down to the Son, returning back to the Father, back and forth, mutual, infinite energy, infinite personal energy between the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is the love of God, just as the Son is God's understanding or knowing himself. Now, why, did, why bring that up in the middle of this deal on end for which God created the world? Well, because Edwards has been doing something that you might think of as very sneaky. Okay? Remember who he's arguing with. He's arguing with these moral philosophers, many of whom are deists they don't, or Unitarians. They don't believe in the deity of the Son. Jesus was a great moral teacher. Think Thomas Jefferson, if you know anything about Jefferson. Sort of believes in God. All, we have, there's a creator, and he endowed us with rights. He's, he's good with that. Um, but the idea of a trinity just is irrational. So you can't just come out and say that. So what do you do? Well, you start talking in Edward's terms about, look at this, a display of perfections, a knowledge of perfections, a love of and delight in perfections, and a communication of internal fullness. And you say, well, that's four, not three. There's three persons. And I wonder if you see how Edward did link it up. So again, think subterranean river, right? The display of professions, perfections, what's that? Well, that's kind of like the Father. And then God knows himself. How? Well, that's in the Son. And then you mutual love and delight. Well, that's the Holy Spirit. So what about this fourth one? Well, I'd suggest that what Edwards does is this. How do they relate to each other? The fourth is the real thing. The fourth is the end. The first three answers are simply Edward's sneaky, sneaky is probably not the best word, subtle, clever, wise way of talking about the triune God. Not just generic deity, overflowing, emanating, communicating himself, but the triune God, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, if, so in other words, what he's just done is if you're one of these deists and you're reading along and you're kind of following this tightly woven chain here and you've agreed with his assumptions and you're just following through and you're going, yep, God would display of attributes, that works. And l- knowledge of attributes, yep, clearly. Love for attributes, yep, got it. By the end of it, what Edwards has done is he's basically said, yeah, buddy, you are now, congratulations, you're now a Trinitarian Christian. Welcome back to orthodoxy, right? It's very, very subtle and brilliant because if you know the way he thinks about the Trinity, you can't help but see he's kind of carved it up that way. The same way that he talks about God's knowledge of himself and love for himself in the essay on the Trinity shows up here in the end for which God created the world. So that the fullness that overflows from God is a Trinitarian fullness. Just in case you were wondering if that's actually true, can you actually point to anything? Well, this is one of his miscellanies, one of those notebooks I mentioned in an earlier session. So this is one of these miscellanies, and he's thinking about this idea of God overflowing. Gosh, how do I, I gotta think about God overflowing. And one of the problems that you run into when you start thinking about God overflowing is this. Remember that first criteria, right? That uh, we can't, it can't imply any lack in God. It can't make God needy. And there's one, one way you, God could be needy would be God's bucket of joy is 99% full, and he makes people, and we're that 1% that icing on the cake, and now God is really happy. And we would say, ugh, bad. We don't want to be the 1% like that, right? We don't want to give anything to God. We can't give anything to God. It's inconsistent with creation, inconsistent with God's happiness. Okay, that's one way that God could be needy. What's another way God could be needy? Well, what if God has to overflow? What if he's like a pressure cooker? What if it's like the beans are on the stove and the lid's starting to shake, and if you don't watch it, you're going to have beans on the ceiling? What if God's that way? What if he's the sort of being but that can't help it but overflow? It's necessary for him to create. It's necessary for him to make a world. Isn't that a different kind of deficiency? If he can't help it, if, he's just, if it's just like he's, you know, the world is God's explosion. And just, he, can't, he can't hold it in and blah, there it is. Feels like that's a different kind of deficiency. and It would be a, equally a problem. Whether it's a deficiency of need, like he lacks the 1%, or a deficiency of excess, he can't help but overflow, we have a problem. Edwards is, this is why he said, saying that he creates for his glory is really a problem. Because if he has to do it, it's a different kind of need. How does Edwards solve it? Right here. This twofold way of the deities flowing forth 
ad extra, remember that means outside, answers to the twofold way of the deity, deity preceding ad intra, in the preceding and generation of the Son, and the preceding and breathing forth of the Holy Spirit. And indeed, is only a kind of second preceding of the same persons. They're going forth ad extra as before they preceded ad intra. You get what that's saying? It's as though he's got this internal fullness, remember? What is that, what, and what is that internal fullness? That internal fullness is God exists and has perfections, and he knows those perfections in his son, and he loves those perfections in, in the Holy Spirit, and so there's this internal procession, right? The, the deities proceeding ad intra, in generation of the son from all eternity, breathing forth of the spirit from all eternity. That's internal. What then is creation? What, what is he trying to accomplish in creation? It's a kind of second proceeding of the same persons. They're going out, whereas before they were just in. Does that make sense? In other words, does God have to overflow, add extra? No, because he's fully fulfilled in his breathing forth and pouring forth internally because he knows himself perfectly in the Son and he delights in himself perfectly in the Holy Spirit. Or again, these two ways of the divine good beaming forth are agreeable to the two ways of the divine essence flowing out or proceeding from eternity within the Godhead in the person of the Son and Holy Spirit. The one in an expression of his glory, in the idea or knowledge of it, that's, we saw that earlier, the other flowing out of the essence in love and joy. It is condescent, meaning it's fitting, it's fitting that correspondent to those proceedings of the divinity ad intra, God should also flow forth ad extra. In other words, if God's the sort of God who flows internally this way, Right? that he knows himself and loves himself, if that's who God is as the triune God, then it would be fitting if he were going to overflow that he would also overflow that way. That his going out would be the same thing as his going in. His internal flow would match his external flow. And here's how that solves that problem. He, he's not a pressure cooker. He's always eternally met the desire for overflow. It's just been inner flow, <laughs> for lack of a better term. He's always known himself and flowed forth in love and delight. He's met that need as an original property of his nature because he is the triune God. But because he's the triune God, it's fitting, that's the key word. That's the word Edwards comes back to again and again in the treatise. He, says, he never says it's necessary. He always says it's fitting. Like, in other words, if God does it this way, it needs to fit, it needs to match. And it's fitting that if he's this sort of God, when he flows out, he should flow out in knowledge of his attributes and perfections and love for his attributes and perfections. That would, be the, that would, that would match the kind of God that he is. The one last end of all things may be expressed thus. It is that the infinite good might be communicated. You hear the fourth candidate right there? Overflow of infinite fullness and good that it might be communicated to, or rather in, that's an important word, we'll come back to that later, okay? Not just communicated to, communicated in the understandings of the creature, which communication is God's declarative glory, and that it might be communicated to the other faculty, usually called the will, which is making the creature happy in God as a partaker of God's happiness. So the end of things is that God's gonna communicate his infinite good, his infinite fullness. How? By communicating to creaturely minds, and to creaturely hearts. So here's how he says it in the end for which God created the world. There are many reasons to think that what God has in view in an increasing communication of himself through eternity is an increasing knowledge of God, love to him, and joy in him. And it's to be considered that the more those divine communications increase in the creature, the more it, the creature, becomes one with God. For so much the more is it united to God in love. The heart is drawn nearer and nearer to God, and the union with him becomes more firm and close. And at the same time, the creature becomes more and more conformed to God. The image is more and more perfect, and so the good that is in the creature comes forever nearer and nearer to an identity with that which is in God. In the view, therefore, of God who has a comprehensive prospect of the increasing union and conformity through eternity, it must be an infinitely strict and 
perfect nearness, conformity, and oneness, for it will forever come nearer and nearer to that strictness and perfection of union which there is between the Father and the Son. So what's God after in creation? Ever increasing, is the word from here, an increasing communication of him, increasing knowledge, love, and joy in the creature, and that God, because he's God, can look at this eternal increase of knowledge, love, and joy, and he can kind of stand up above it, outside of the temporal thing, and he can see the whole of it at a glance. It's eternal. It goes on forever. But he can see all of it at once, and he can say, it's as though it was infinite. It was as though my oneness with my creatures was so close that it's like the oneness that I have with the Father and the Son. That oneness, that union, that, that nearness, that conformity, that closeness that we have, if you could take uh, eternity and smash it into like a moment would be an infinite closeness. That's the point. It's kind of like this. I wonder if there's math people. Math people all of a sudden perk up at this moment because they go, oh, I know something that sounds just like that. You guys remember what an asymptote is? From your, I don't know, what class, calculus, geometry, I don't know what it would be. In. I don't know anything about math other than an asymptote. Here's what an asymptote is. An asymptote is a function in which this curved line gets closer and closer and closer to this axis and never touches it. It just goes on. Those two lines just go up and up and up forever, getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, but never, ever, ever touching it. And what Edwards is saying is that's what God's doing. That's the end for which God created the world would be that there would be a creaturely existence of knowledge of God, love to God, delight in God that would get ever and ever closer to what the Father and the Son have always had and that that would go on forever, so, so much so that if, God, if you could actually take it and look, and, and look at it, it would be as though they touched. As though creatures became God, which they never do, because the lines never, ever meet. It goes on forever and ever and ever. Amen. This is the answer. This is Edward's preliminary answer. You think there's more? Well, yeah, he's got to fill it out even more than this. But the preliminary answer is something like this. Christ has brought it to pass that those that the Father has given him should be brought into the household of God, that he and his Father and they should be, as it were, one society, one family, that his people should be in a sort, okay, there's, that, there's remember the Edwardsian escape hatch? It's the, the ish of Edwards. That people should be admitted into that society-ish of the three persons of the Godhead. In this family or household, God is the Father. Jesus Christ is his own natural and eternally begotten Son. The saints, they also are children in the family. The church is the daughter of God, being the spouse of his Son. They all have communion in the same spirit, the Holy Ghost. It's as though you're being brought into the family of God as a full member. Not like, you know, the, the stepkid who has to sit at the other table. No, no, you get brought in, and you get brought further up and further in forever, so that if you could get to the end of forever, like if forever had an end, it would be as though you're God, but forever doesn't have an end. That's what it means to be forever. You'll just get closer and closer and closer to the communion that the Father has with the Son. In other words, here's the preliminary answer. This is my restatement of Edward's preliminary answer. God created the world so that created beings might become partakers of the divine nature. That's 2 Peter chapter 1 invited into the fellowship of the Godhead, united to God in an ever-increasing unity for all eternity. Or, as Edward says in a number of places, God created the world to get a bride for his son. Remember that? As though he were not in his most complete state without her. The fullness. What, is the, what, what are we doing when we're making this world? We're getting fullness we are inclined to overflow. It would be fitting. We don't have to. We're already fully complete in ourselves, but it'd be good. It'd be fitting if we overflowed. So if we overflow, let's make some people so that we can overflow into them and then in them, in their knowledge of us and their love and delight for us, that will be the church. And that church will be the fullness of Christ that will be the spouse of Christ, the bride of Christ brought into this family so that if that's what you have at the beginning, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, at the end, you have the same thing. Say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 
Only now it's father, son, bride. The fullness of him who fills all in all.